This video is an overview of the chemical thermodynamics playlist. We start by looking at gas properties, and we have the ideal gas equation that PV bar equals RT, pressure times molar volume equals gas constant times temperature. And we can move to more advanced equations of state which do not assume that the particles are non-interacting, like the van der Waals equation of state, P plus a parameter for attractions A over molar volume squared times molar volume minus a parameter B for the repulsions between molecules, their effective molecular size, equals RT. And we have more advanced equations of state like the virial equation of state where the compressibility factor Z, which is P V bar over RT, equals one, which it would be for the ideal gas equation, plus <clears throat> then we have a Taylor series summing from I equals one up to infinity of the second virial coefficient times uh, pressure plus third virial coefficient times pressure squared, et cetera, et cetera, as far as you want to go. We look at statistical mechanics, where we note that the energy of a given molecular system is quantized in terms of translational, rotational, vibrational, and electronic energy levels. We look at the Boltzmann factor, which is determines that the probability of a molecule being in a given a quantized state is proportional to the exponential times its negative energy over Boltzmann constant times temperature, the Boltzmann factor being this whole exponential here. We have the partition function, which is the sum over all states of their Boltzmann factors, and the partition function can give us any property of the system that we're interested in if we know what it is, taking various types of manipulations to it. One particular example is we can calculate the average energy of a chemical system uh, if we take the negative partial derivative of the natural log of the partition function with respect to beta, which is the inverse temperature, 1 over Boltzmann constant times temperature. We then go into the laws of thermodynamics, look at the first law and enthalpy. The first law of thermodynamics is that the energy change of the universe is zero, energy of the universe is constant, which is equal to the energy change of the system plus the surroundings, which is what we are interested in plus everything else in the universe. We define the work of a c expansion or compression of gas as the negative integral from the, final to the initial to the final state of the external pressure times the change in volume. We can do this isothermally, where the temperature doesn't change. We can do it adiabatically, where there's no heat. And we define enthalpy as the internal energy, U, or the E from back here, from the first law. Enthalpy as U plus pressure times volume. And we can look at various types of enthalpy, that which occurs during phase transitions, enthalpy of formation, and enthalpy of reaction. The second law of thermodynamics says that the entropy change for any process which occurs in an isolated system is greater than or equal to zero. We first look at the entropy as the change in entropy being the heat divided by the temperature for a given process. We look at expansion entropy, where the entropy of expansion is, gas is the number of moles times gas constant times natural log of volume, uh, final volume minus an over initial volume. And this entropy is a measure of disorder, and disorder tends to increase over time within isolated systems. And we also looked at some other expressions for it in terms of statistical mechanics, the Boltzmann formula or entropy equals Boltzmann constant times natural log of the number of microstates, and the Gibbs energy when the microstates do not have the same probabilities, where entropy is minus Boltzmann constant times sum over energy all the different energy states of their probability times natural log of their probability. And finally, the third law of thermodynamics says that the entropy of a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin is zero. This helps us determine the entropy at any given temperature for a substance because we also know that the entropy change going from one temperature to another is the integral from temp T1 to T2 of the constant pressure heat capacity divided by the temperature. We can also supplement, supplement this by the entropy changes of transition during some type of phase change, 
which is equal to the enthalpy of that transition divided by the temperature at which it occurs. We also look at the differences in entropy when we calculate them using statistical mechanics or when we uh, measure them using some type of calorimetry. And the difference is some residual entropy which often occurs due to imperfections in the crystal. And then once we have all of these values, we use all of our laws of thermodynamics and we can define the entropy for a given reaction, the entropy change. We'll move on then to define the Gibbs and the Helmholtz energy. Helmholtz energy is internal energy minus temperature times entropy. Gibbs energy is internal energy minus TS plus PV plus pressure times volume. All of these thermodynamic state functions have various uh, variables in which it is natural to express them. For internal energy, it's entropy and volume. For Helmholtz energy, it's temperature and volume. For Gibbs energy, it's temperature and pressure. These types of variable expressions give rise to Maxwell relations, which occur to, due to the equality of second mixed partial derivatives. And they often give us something which is easy to compute, like the derivative of pressure with respect to temperature, in terms of something which is harder to compute, like the derivative of entropy with respect to volume. We can then do things like calculate the change in Gibbs energy as we change the pressure of a gas or a more advanced kind of metric for real gases called the fugacity as the standard Gibbs energy plus RT times log of fugacity. And we can calculate how the Gibbs energy changes with respect to temperature or how the Gibbs energy divided by temperature changes with respect to temperature, which is the negative enthalpy divided by T squared, which is the Gibbs Helmholtz equation. And we can also define for this for this fugacity a metric which def, which defines how a gas behaves non-ideally, which is the fugacity divided by the pressure, which for ideal gases is one, since fugacity and pressure are the same for ideal gases. For phase diagrams, we have <clears throat> a graph of pressure or the natural log of pressure versus temperature, and a map of what is the equilibrium phase in a given region. There are also coexistence curves where the phases are in equilibrium, as well as a triple point where all three are, and a critical point beyond which the liquid and gas become a supercritical fluid. We can look at how these values change with respect to temperature or pressure in terms of things like the molar entropy and the molar volume of a given phase. We can define the Clapeyron equation for the coexistence curves and how they change in terms of the molar enthalpy and molar volume. And we can look at the more advanced clausius clapeyron equation, which is for coexistence curves between gas and another phase due to the non-constant molar volume of gases, the, being the natural log of the ratio of the pressures equals negative enthalpy of vaporization, if you're talking about liquid gas coexistence, divided by R times the difference in the inverses of the temperatures. We go on to liquid-liquid solutions, where the most important properties are often partial molar quantities, which are the derivative of a property with respect to the number of moles of a given substance within that solution. We can connect the chemical potentials of various substances in the solution to each other through the gibbs duhem equation, which says that the sum over all of the components of a solution is of their mole fraction times their change in chemical potential equals zero. So we relate their changes in chemical potential. We have Raoul's law, which says that the vapor pressure of a given component in the solution is equal to its mole fraction times the vapor pressure of its, of its pure liquid, which becomes true for all components as their mole fraction approaches one. We also have Henry's law, which says that the vapor pressure is equal to some Henry's law constant times the pressure of them as a, pure, as a pure liquid as their mole fraction goes to zero. So this is actually, should be pi star here, if I correct that. Then we can also define uh, various quantities called the activity, which is kind of a effective mole fraction for solutions which are behaving non-ideally. Raoul's law gives us nice expressions for the chemical potential of species within an within a solution if they behave ideally, but 
activity gives us those same nice expressions, but for things that behave non-ideally. And the activity coefficient, again, is just the activity divided by the mole fraction. For solid-liquid solutions, we have one component which is sparingly soluble or, or only present in a small mole fraction called the solute, and one which dominates the mole fraction called the solvent. We can define different metrics for the concentration of the solute, such as mole fraction, molality, or molarity. And we can get the molarity of a non-volatile solute or something which doesn't have an appreciable vapor pressure, we can get its chemical potential from the chemical potential of the other of the solvent through the Gibbs Duhem equation. One of the most important things in solid liquid solutions are colligative properties, which depend not on the identity of a solute but only on its concentration. The things like the depression of the freezing point of a of a solvent based off of the molality of a given solute, the elevation of the boiling point of a solvent based off of the molality of its solute, and the osmotic pressure which occurs in an aqueous solution due only to the concentration uh, difference in a solute across a semi-permeable membrane. For electrolytes, we have special expressions for their activity, things like mean ionic activity and the activity of the cation and of the anion, and those and those can be calculated for dilute electrolytes through the Debye-Huckel theory, which tells us that the natural log of the activity mean ionic activity coefficients comes through things like the charge of the ions, the Debye-Huckel screening length, uh, and the dielectric constant of the solvent, as well as temperature. Chemical equilibrium is based off of the reaction Gibbs energy, which we first define as the partial derivative of the Gibbs energy with respect to extent of reaction, telling us whether the reaction is going to go forward or backward and how much. The equilibrium constant comes from the uh, products being raised to the power of their stoichiometric coefficients and multiplied together, divided by the same quantity but on the denominator for reactants, a to the power of its stoichiometric coefficient, etc., etc., we define the standard Gibbs energy of reaction as minus gas constant times temperature times natural log of our equilibrium constant. And then the Gibbs energy of reaction is the standard Gibbs energy plus RT times the natural log of the reaction, co uh, the reaction quotient, which is the same as the equilibrium constant when they're at equilibrium, but when these values are not equilibrium values, it is just the reaction quotient. If the reaction Gibbs energy is less than zero, then the reaction will go forward, the extent of reaction being positive, and vice versa if the Gibbs energy is greater than zero. And we can also see the temperature dependence of the equilibrium constants through the Vant Off equation, which is the natural log of the equilibrium constant is proportional to the inverse of the temperature, and that relationship depends on what the uh, standard enthalpy of reaction is going to be. And finally, we finish with electrochemistry, where we have some electrochemical cell, where you have some uh, you have some anode where an oxidation reaction occurs, a cathode where a reduction reaction occurs. Uh, each of those two half cell reactions represented here, where a reduction at the cathode and an oxidation at the anode. We can represent a cell more concisely with a cell diagram, where we have our anode on the left, our cathode on the right, and a salt bridge in the middle with a double bar. The energy, the Gibbs energy change of this reaction is comes from the Nernst equation, which is equal to the minus number of moles of electrons transferred times Faraday's constant times the EMF of the cell, the electromotive force. And this electromotive force comes from a standard EMF minus RT over this NF times the natural log of the reaction quotient. The standard EMF comes from tables of our standard reduction potentials, which we use from the standard reduction potential of the, of the cathode minus the standard reduction potential of the anode. We can also measure things like the en enthalpy and entropy of the reaction by looking at the temperature dependence of the EMF and its Gibbs energy. 
And we can also set up situations where we can determine equilibrium constants such as Ksp, the solubility product, for various ionic equations if we set up electrochemical cells such that the net ionic reaction in the cell is the dissolving into aqueous solution of a given sparingly soluble salt.